Now remember, Jeremiah's message to Judah in their final 22 years came in two stages. Stage one, repent of your idolatry and injustice and maybe God will spare you from the boiling pot coming from the north. But then stage two, man, you have passed the point of no return. Babylon is coming and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, in chapters two through 10, we're still in stage one. And these chapters, they come to us in three blocks, two to six, chapter seven, and then eight through 10. And one of the clues to this structural division is oracle introductory um, markers or formulas. Now, you may ask, what is that? Well, you gotta remember that uh, the books of the prophets were originally spoken oracles, spoken out loud, and then someone would transcribe them, probably the prophet himself, um, and these transcribed oracles would be gathered, collected together, and then arranged very carefully into the books of the prophets as we have them now. So one of the tools we must use then when we read the prophets is to look for individual oracles. And we can do that by identifying um, oracle introductory formulas. Let me show you a couple of them in chapter two. So here's one oracle introductory formula. The word of the Lord came to me. Here's another one, thus says the Lord. And another one, declares the Lord. All these little phrases help us to divide the, um, the text together, um, to divide it um, into its different logical units. And it is kind of difficult to determine, um, is this a major division? Is this a minor division? And of course, we must just trace the, the context um, to um, come to that determination. Well, let's return to chapters two through 10 and look at some of these major blocks. Um, I'll take a look at a chart that I've put together uh, describing how these sections are arranged. And I did get some help for this chart. Um, many of the charts which we will look at together in these lectures, I have uh, adapted from a scholar named Tim Mackey. He, he has an eye for um, structural literary design and I, I love that and I found it really helpful. Um, so I, I've adapted some of his work. And notice in chapters two through 10, we have these three major sections, each of which begin with a oracle introductory marker, a major one. Um, the word of the Lord came to me in 2.1. The word which Jeremiah uh, had from Yahweh saying in chapter seven, and you will speak to them, thus says Yahweh in chapter eight, verse four. And in this first section, we have a kind of a collection of Jeremiah's major themes of judgment. Um, we have accusations uh, here in the first section, and then a call for repentance, and then a warning of coming judgment from that enemy, that boiling pot from the north. Now, I wanna take a closer look at these accusations. So one of the, the prophet's favorite metaphors for Israel's sin is idolatry as adultery. So um, at Mount Sinai, when Israel entered into a covenant with Yahweh, it was as if they entered into marriage. Whenever you think covenant, think marriage. Um, but then what happened afterwards is they, they served and worshiped other gods. This was like an act of, of adultery, um, of, of marital unfaithfulness. Now see how this is um, identified uh, strongly in chapter two, Jeremiah's opening oracle. We just looked at the, the formula, it's introductory formula, now let's look at its content. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as my bride, Yahweh says. You followed me through the wilderness, looked up to the sky um, as I gave you manna, from heaven, but then what did you do? Um, has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? You looked to other men, to other gods and worshiped them instead. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Think about the water from the rock in the wilderness. And they hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Israel's cheating on, on their husband, on Yahweh. Now all of this is going to culminate in chapter seven, Jeremiah's temple sermon. Now I wanna uh, put a pause button on this here and talk about Jesus for a minute. Now you remember Jesus's triumphal entry. He gets on a, a donkey, rides into the city, goes up to the temple, and then he overturns the tables of the money changers and he calls this place a den of robbers. 
Where do you think Jerob, where do you think Jesus got the idea to do this? Well, he got it from Jeremiah, who did the very same thing, minus the donkey. Take a look at chapter 7, where God is going to tell Jeremiah to go march right into the temple and denounce the place. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, Yahweh says to Jeremiah, and say, thus says the Lord, if you repent, if you amend your ways and your deeds, then I will let you dwell in this place place that is the temple you can continue to worship me in this temple if you amend your ways however if you go after other gods if you make offerings to the Baal you know what I'll do to to this place to the Lord's house well why don't you go take a look at Shiloh you remember Shiloh you know that's where my my Ark of the Covenant the tabernacle resided before it was brought into Jerusalem well remember what happened to Shiloh by the Phil uh, from the hands of the Philistines, they came in and they ransacked the place. They took the Ark of the Covenant over to Philistia. Now, they didn't enjoy it when they did have it, but God says, I will do the same thing to this house as I did to Shiloh in those days. I won't think twice about it. Well, he says you can avert this if you repent. And the word for repent that Jeremiah uses, his favorite word is Shuv, um, shin vav bait. It, it means to to turn, and it can have multiple senses. It could mean to turn back to Yahweh, turn to me, repent. But it could also mean to turn away from Yahweh and to go towards these other gods. Um, take a look at how Jeremiah plays with the multiple senses of this word. Let's jump back to chapter three. Shuv. Shuv, O oh sons of Shuving. Now, the word Shuv is used in all of these verbs here in green. Shuv, O oh sons of Shuving, and I will heal your Shuvingness. Um, chapter 8. <coughs> if one Shuvs, does, doesn't he not Shuv back? Doesn't he just turn back to, to where he turned from? Well, why then does this people Shuv away in perpetual Shuving? They don't hold fast to me. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to Shuv. Um, but what does God promise? He promises that if you do shuv, oh, you shuving Israel, then I will not look at you in anger, but I will be merciful to you. Just acknowledge your guilt. Um, claim, say that I have rebelled against you, Yahweh, and I will return to you. Then I will take you, I will bring you back to Zion. That's his promise um, here in these chapters. Now, the next section, um, Jeremiah 11 to 20, I admit, it is a little bit complicated. But we can wrap our mind around these chapters by, chase, uh, by tracing the shifts in genre. Five times in these chapters, um, it's going to shift from narrative to poetry, usually a, a, a judgment oracle, to a lament. And a lament is a, a personal um, cry out from Jeremiah, the prophet himself, not to the people, but to God himself. A very unique element in the book of Jeremiah. So this is going to happen five times, 11 to 12, 13 to 15, 16 and 17, 7 and 18, 19 and 20. We're going to have these narrative poem lament, narrative poem lament, narrative poem lament. Take a look at a chart. If ever we needed a chart, it was here. All right, let's look at these shifts in genre. Let's make this a little bit smaller. Okay, so we see here um, this transition in genre. Uh, narrative, poem, lament. Narrative, poem, lament. Narrative, poem, lament. Now, the, the structure isn't, you know, it isn't perfect, but it's definitely present, um, this transition in a structure. And notice how many of these narratives include the performance of a sign act. Now, what's this about underwear? Oh, my gosh, Jeremiah, what's going on here? Well, God tells him in chapter 13 to take um, linen undergarments, the same kind of thing that you would wear as, as underwear, I guess, in those days, and march all the way up to the Euphrates, something like 500 miles away, and take these linen undergarments and dig into the banks of the Euphrates and shove them in there and bury it up and then go back home, wait a little bit, and then march back up to the Euphrates, get those linen undergarments, and come back to Judah and present them to the people and say, this is what you were like, um, says Yahweh. I wanted for you to cling close to me. 
just like a pair of silk underwear. <laughs> it's weird, right? I wanted you to cling to me, but now you are worthless. You are defiled. Another sign act in this section, in chapter 16, Yahweh forbids Jeremiah from, from marriage. You cannot get married, Jeremiah. This will be a sign to the people. Everyone got married in those days. This will be a sign to the people um, that their wives and their children will die in the siege if they don't repent. Um, <clears throat> Now, I want to take a look at one of these sequences together, where it goes from narrative, poem, lament. Let's, let's look at chapter 18 together to see this, this transition in genre. Okay, let's jump to chapter 18, where here is our um, narrative moment. It's another sign act where Yahweh tells Jeremiah to go to a potter's house and check out what he's doing. And, and God's like, this is what you'll see. Um, he'll be making a vessel out of clay, and then the vessel will get all messed up on the turning table. Um, and then what's he going to do? He's going to take this clay and he's like, you know what? It's pretty bad right now, but I think I can rework it, and I can turn it into something else. And God says, this is what the house of Israel is like. It, it was deformed. It was messed up in my hands, but I can still, I can still fix it. If you turn from your evil ways and relent, uh, then I will relent of this disaster. Turn from your evil ways. Shuv. So here's this narrative um, sign act that Jeremiah is performing. And then there's a poetic oracle of judgment where he says, but my people have forgotten me. They make offerings to the gods. They've committed adultery with me, their husband. Um, therefore, I will scatter them like the east wind before the enemy. And I will show my back to them and not my face in the day of their calamity. And then we're going to transition into a lament, right? Narrative poem lament, um, where the people, um, this is, remember, what we call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. Well, the people are going to make a plot against Jeremiah's life. Let us strike him with our, with our tongue, accuse him. Um, therefore, Jeremiah is going to turn around and he's going to address God um, with these first person pronouns. And he's going to say, listen to the voice of my adversaries, their plots that they make against me. We have a little mini chiasm going on here. See this? You know their plots, um, how they dig a pit for my life. They've dug a pit to take me. Therefore, in the center, vindicate your prophet. Br deliver them up, my enemies, to famine, sword, and pestilence. So there's one sequence here between narrative poem and lament. Um, there is an interesting moment that takes place in chapter 11. And I think that this moment kind of helps us understand the, the transition between 2 through 10 and 11 through 20. So in the beginning of chapter 11, um, Jeremiah and, and, and God through Jeremiah are going to bring Israel back to the moment of, of making the covenant out at Mount Sinai. He's going to reflect on that moment and what's happened since then. Take a look. Let's jump back to chapter 11 for the significant moment. What's happening here? Um, <clears throat> I commanded your fathers when I brought them out of Egypt. We went to Sinai together. I said, listen to me, listen to my voice, and you will be my people. I will be your God. The fundamental covenant um, language there. Um, and if you do, I will bring you into the land of milk and honey. And they said, hey, we're going to do it. So be it, Lord. But what happened? The people did not obey my voice or incline their ear to me. And what happened since then? Well, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem today and Jeremiah's day are just like their fathers. They turn back to the iniquity of their forefathers. They've gone after other gods to serve them. And now it appears as if there is a shift. Something happened fundamentally. It changed in Yahweh's relationship with his covenant people. Because it says here that the house of Judah has broken my covenant. They broke the covenant that I made with their fathers. Therefore, something's going to happen. Look, we have an oracle introductory formula. Therefore, thus says the Lord, something's going to go down. I am bringing disaster upon them that they cannot escape. Before, they could always escape if they, if they repented, if they turned. But now... We're in stage two, you guys. Now they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. And I won't listen to the people, and I won't listen to their prophets. Therefore, God says to Jeremiah, 
do not pray for this people. Don't lift up a cry or a prayer on their behalf because I will not listen to them or to you. Now, this is a pretty big deal um, here in the book of Jeremiah, but I want to I want to take another moment to fast forward 550 years to uh, Jesus. And remember, in Matthew 16, when Jesus asks his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they're like, well, some people say John the Baptist. And you know what? Other people say um, Elijah or one of the prophets. And then someone says, some of the people say the prophet Jeremiah. What? How did Jeremiah make that list? Well, that's because um, the faithful Jews, the faithful Israelites in those days were looking for a prophet like Moses. Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy 34, and our buddy Jeremiah looks a whole lot like Moses. Um, lots of similarities between the two of them. Um, both of them served as a prophet for 40 years. Um, we're told very specifically that Jeremiah's ministry began in the 13th year of Josiah, which is 627, and it ended, of course, with the destruction of Babylon or the destruction of uh, Jerusalem in 587. 40 years. Um, both of them, both Moses and Jeremiah, were cast into the water. Um, Moses, as an infant, you know, into the into the Nile, and Jeremiah was thrown into a uh, into a cistern in chapter 38. I mean, suffering prophet. I'm telling you. Um, both of them, Moses and Jeremiah, were saved by a Gentile um, slave from the waters, taken up from the waters. <clears throat> and look also at the similarities between the commission of Jeremiah and the commission of Moses. Think about Exodus chapter 3. Look at these similarities here. Jeremiah is a prophet like Moses who cannot intercede like Moses. Moses. Look at their calling. I have known you, which this is said both of um, Samuel, um, or both of Moses, and then um, similarities also to Samuel. And there's a reason that we're comparing Jeremiah to both Moses and Samuel, and you'll find that out in a minute. Um, now, did you catch that in Jeremiah 1? Uh, he says, oh Lord, I do not know how to speak when Yahweh calls him to be his prophet. And that reminds us so much of Moses who made the same excuse, please, Lord, I am not a man of debar, of words. Um, of course, Jeremiah was a young man when he was called, and, and so was Samuel when he entered into the service of Yahweh. But then look at this. This is so important. Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, talking about the prophet like you, the prophet like Moses. Yahweh says, I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them all that I command him. And look what God says of Jeremiah in the opening chapter. All that I command you, you will speak. I put my words in your mouth. They have the same message, Moses and, um, and Jeremiah. Uh, if, if you really compare um, the, the speeches of Jeremiah in 11 to 20, uh, so they're very similar to um, what Moses has to say to Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, but the one key glaring difference between Moses and Jeremiah is that Moses he acted as an intercessor. That was one of his key roles, his responsibilities for the people, as to intercede on behalf of his sinful nation to Yahweh. But God forbids Jeremiah from um, acting as an intercessor. <laughs> he says to Jeremiah, you shall not pray for this people. Look at this, so curious. Do not pray on behalf of this people. Do not lift up a shout of prayer there in the, the temple sermon. Moses, he interceded for the people. So did Samuel. He prayed on their behalf, but not Jeremiah, though they had the same message, Jeremiah and Moses. Um, in chapter 11, do not pray on behalf of this people. Chapter 14, do not pray for good on behalf of this people, for I am not listening to their shout. And now, key moment in Jeremiah 15, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me and interceded for this people, I would not come toward them. There is no amount of prayer from the most righteous person you can imagine will avert the destruction coming on Jerusalem because of their sins. <coughs> And therefore, the word of the Lord, which Jeremiah is commissioned to speak, 
to um, Judah is nothing but judgment, judgment, judgment. Now, what do you think a message like that does to your head? Well, this very unique book of Jeremiah tells us exactly what it does. Five times um, here in these chapters, Jeremiah is going to speak not for God as his spokesperson, but rather to God, crying out in lament. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at some of the things he says in these laments. Let's just jump to chapter 20, the last one. These are pretty gut-wrenching. For whenever I speak, Jeremiah is complaining. He says, I shout, violence and destruction. That is the word of the Lord that Yahweh told me I have to speak to this people. I have to speak violence and destruction. Um, but this word, this word of violence and destruction, of coming judgment, has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. Everyone hates me because I tell them of the violence and destruction that's coming on them because of their sin. So you know what? Um, because I am derided all day long, I'll, I won't speak about God. I, I'll, I'll shut my mouth. I won't speak anymore in his name. But when I do that, there is within my heart this burning fire. The, the word of the Lord is, is consuming in my bones, and I have to speak out. And when I do, all I say is violence and destruction, and everyone hates me for it. And they persecute me um, as a prophet speaking for their good. Therefore, Jeremiah concludes, cursed be the day on which I was born. This is just like Job chapter 3, the day when my mother bore me. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father, a son is born to you. Why? Jeremiah cries, why did I come out of the womb just to see toil and sorrow and spend all my days in shame? Um, he says similar things in chapter 15. Why, he cries, is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? <clears throat> and then he, he speaks to, to Yahweh, and what does he say? Why, O oh Yahweh, why have you become to me a deceitful brook? And what's interesting about these laments, twice, um, in both chapter 11 and 15, in these laments, um, they become like a conversation, a conversation between Yahweh and Jeremiah. They're going to talk it out together. It's going to go back and forth. Well, look what, um, how Yahweh, Yahweh responds to Jeremiah here in this lament in chapter 15. What does he say? It's curious. It's interesting. It's powerful. Thus says the Lord in response to Jeremiah, if you, Jeremiah, my prophet, you need a shuv, buddy. If you shuv, hey, I'll restore you just like I restore Judah. If they shuv, you need to utter what is precious, um, not what is worthless. Then you'll be my mouthpiece, just like I promised in chapter one. And you know what? I promise I will protect you. It won't be easy, but I will protect you. I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They'll shoot arrows at you and they'll just go ding, ding, ding. They'll bounce off this wall of bronze. I'll save you and I will deliver you. This is so interesting, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's nothing else like this in the prophets. Why do you think we're given this, this window into the psychology of the prophet? Well, I think it is because this suffering prophet gives us a taste of the pain of our suffering servant Messiah in Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 53. Take a look at how um, Jeremiah and his laments have been designed to um, mirror the, um, the cries of the suffering servant from Isaiah. All these connections. Their commission is so similar, these two. I formed you in the womb, um, said of Jeremiah, but the same is said of the suffering servant. Um, he was formed in the womb to be his servant. <coughs> Look at this. I have made you, Jeremiah, a prophet to the nations. I have made you, suffering servant, to be a light to the nations. Do not be afraid, for I am with, with you. Same phrase spoken to both of them. I have put my words in your mouth. Um, Isaiah 59, that is said of uh, the servant. And then look at these laments. Um, I am like a lamb led to the slaughter, says Jeremiah. He will be like a lamb led to the slaughter, Isaiah 53. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, Jeremiah's persecutors say of him. For he was cut off from the land of the living, Isaiah 
53. Um, Jeremiah says that, Yahweh, you are righteous. I will bring my case to you. Similar language is used of the, the servant in Isaiah 50. Both uh, were exposed to public shame um, and abhorrence. Uh, that they both experienced pain and wounds, both made like, like a fortified strong wall or rock. Why is this done? Well, both Jeremiah and Jesus, um, they ministered in a period before the destruction of the temple, before the destruction of Jerusalem. Only two prophets did that. And both of these prophets prophesied the destruction of the temple. Think about Matthew 24. Both Jeremiah and Jesus, they wept over the city of Jerusalem. They both called the temple a den of robbers. Um, remember chapter 7. Both Jesus and Jeremiah were forcibly taken from Egypt because of political, um, taken to Egypt because of political persecution. Jesus as, as a young man and um, Jeremiah as, as an old man. Both were rejected by their hometown, Nazareth, and Anathoth, and both Jeremiah and Jesus were beaten and imprisoned. But that is not the end of the story for our suffering prophet-like Moses Messiah, for God will restore to the son of David um, the kingdom of Judah and of Israel. And we will see how he will do that in chapters 21 to 44 next.